Welcome everyone, I'm Katie Thompson and I am the current Secretary for Get Glasgow Moving, which is uh, one of the uh, groups that supports the Better Buses for Strathclyde campaign. Thank you all so much for coming along on this glorious summer night. I don't think <laughs> we were expecting it to be such a good turnout, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just going to very briefly go over sort of the format of the evening so you know what to expect. Um, first, in the first half, we're going to have some presentations from our panel members. Uh, firstly, we're going to have Get Glasgow Women's current treasurer, Susan Galloway. Uh, she's going to give a bit of background to the a small bit of background to the campaign for those who may not be familiar, but I can see some familiar faces, so some know our progress so far. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about the recent SPT consultation results um, and about recent political developments and the effects that both of these things will potentially have on our campaign, the Better Buses for Strathclyde campaign moving forward. Then we're going to have Ellie Harrison, who is the current Get Glasgow Moving Chair. She's going to be talking about next steps for the campaign, what you should expect as supporters and where we will be hoping that you will come in and show further support for us, so we'll um, like peak points in the campaign that we're expecting. And then lastly, we're going to have Tam Wilson from STUC, who is going to be talking about the STUC's recently commissioned research, and how it's hopefully going to complement the Better Buses for Strathclyde campaign. Then, with a place here, there'll be a small comfort break um, for anyone who needs to know. There's a toilet there. And there's also some more back out where the lifts are just down one floor. There's no ladies and gents toilets. So during that period, you can have teas and coffees, comfort break, and also there'll be an opportunity in the second part of the meeting where we're going to open up to the floor for discussion. Um, there'll be an opportunity to ask any questions of the panel members about what we've talked about in their presentations. Um, there are post-its and pens on either side of the front of the room here and a rather fetching hat for you to put them in if you don't feel comfortable asking the question like in the kind of format of the meeting but there will also be the opportunity for just the classic hands up and um, as always it'd be great if you could try and keep we appreciate people are passionate about the subject we all are and um, but if you could try and keep it concise keep it to an, a, either a question or to a particular point where you feel like support or idea for the campaign um i think that's everything from me. We are yes. Is it possible to get that screen of the the picture bit on it a bit higher at the top? No, I'm oh, afraid I'm not sure. Okay. It was we had to have a fallback. <laughs> the whole thing was a bit stressful to get to yeah, that's 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 okay. it. Um, I was going to say that we are in recording the first half of the meeting, but we won't be recording the discussion afterwards. Um, and as always, Ellie wants a photo op, so at the end there will be an opportunity for a photo op with our fetching Better Buses for Staff Pride signs, so if that's something you're interested in, please hang about at the end. I do not want to be part of that. Totally understand, you can make a quick exit. So, if, that's, if you think I've covered everything, lovely, I'm going to hand over to Susan first. Thanks, Katie. Um, so I'm just going to kind of set some context and then Ellie's going to talk about the, um, where the campaign goes next. Speak um, up a bit, Susan, please, I will do my best to speak up, yes. That, the, the last time we were all, we, a lot of us were in this room was for our AGM back in February and we've had two significant events since then. The first one in March was obviously when SPT took the decision in principle to go ahead with taking buses back into public control uh, via franchising and also to move ahead with a business plan for a municipal bus company for Strathclyde. Um, obviously a really key and quite, quite ground shifting um, um, time for us. And the second event is that's really kind of changed the kind of bigger picture for the campaign is the election of a Labour government, a Labour UK government, which is committed to more public control over both the rail and the bus networks and I think it's right for us to think about that bigger picture and how that might change things in terms of the leverage we've got over Scottish Government policy um, particularly as a lot of the case we've been making is that Scotland has been left behind as a lot of um, English northern cities are moving ahead with re-regulating their bus networks so that's what, what I'm going to talk about first um, 
And uh, this is Louise Haig, the new UK, well, English Transport Minister, <coughs> um, listening intently to the King's speech on the 17th of July, when a better buses bill, obviously named after our campaign, <laughs> uh, was being um, announced. And, and that better buses bill is going to allow, uh, it's going to rule out the ability for regional transport authorities to re-regulate their bus networks right across England because that's confined to combined authorities at the moment. Um, it's going to speed up the process for that happening. We want to simplify the legislation so that it will be possible to um, re-regulate the bus network within a couple of years, whereas it's two and five or six years or seven years for Greater Manchester to do that. And um, thirdly, and importantly, they're going to lift the ban on publicly owned bus companies in England. It's a ban that's been in place since the Thatcher government imposed it. So that's quite significant um, legislation. And um, here's the Transport Minister making a very first official visit to Greater Manchester to see in practice their re-regulated, integrated uh, public transport system that they've now got since they rolled out, started rolling out bus re-regulation back in September last year. The big question, of course, is whether Labour is going to provide the funding that will allow these things to happen in practice. And that's really a big question. And of course, we had a, a, a um, pretty bad news about that. I don't think it's, you know, it's been quite clear for a while that we're not going to see Labour go on a public spending spree. We're actually going to see more austerity um, and the whole idea that we've got um, too much public debt, well that's not true, that, pu that public spending is a, is a bad thing, that, that it, it is not true. So the bigger picture is we're going to keep on having to make the arguments for, for why spending on public services is important, otherwise we're not going to get better buses or better anything. So that's the bigger, the bigger picture for us. Um, the other, the, the other uh, key thing in terms of uh, the new government policy is that they're saying there'll be closer collaboration between the UK and devolved um, governments. Um, and I think it's worth just reminding ourselves that in terms of transport policy and public transport, there already is an existing mechanism for UK government and Scottish government and local authorities to collaborate on big transport projects and big regional economic development projects, and that is the city deals. So the Glasgow City Region deal, the Ayrshire Growth deal, and um, the other 10 deals around Scotland come out of, U out of UK government legislation, and they involve over a billion pounds of UK government spending in Scotland on these. What, what that money hasn't been used for so far is actually improving public transport. It's mostly been used to build roads, um, so the fact that that exists and it's likely to be something that the Labour government builds on rather than gets rid of. So we need to keep that in our minds as well. But turning to our campaign, the other significant event was DD Decision Day on the 15th of March this year. And well, that's actually that's launching the, the Better Buses campaign back in September. Um, but this is our rally on the 15th of March outside SPT in the rain as usual. <laughs> <laughs> the day that the decision was being announced um, about um, what their plans were in terms of regional bus strategy. And um, that decision in principle by SPT to go ahead with uh, bus free regulation, to go ahead with a business case for a public bus company, um, was really groundbreaking. For, I mean, for our campaign, it was an exciting day. It was a vindication for all the hard work that we've done for about six or seven years now. Um, and at the same time, as, as much as it was a kind of uh, an exciting day, I think there was a huge healthy dose of scepticism in, in how we received that news. And I think if you look at the press coverage underneath the photo there, it says, Ellie Harrison said SPT had to be dragged kicking and screaming, screaming to this decision. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a, I think that probably, as I could quote, probably sums up how you feel about it, because they came out with the right decision, but whether we can all feel terribly confident that we're actually going to see it happen, 
Well, um, maybe not so, but that's our job to make sure that it does happen. Um, and of course, uh, being SPT, um, what happened next, of course, was that there had to be a, yeah, another public consultation, <laughs> a consultation on their decision in principle. Um, and that's what we threw ourselves into during April and May um, campaigning <coughs> to try and make sure there was maximum participation in that consultation, as many people as possible to take part. Really important because it's important for SPT because it's going to have to then approach the Scottish Government to, for funding for this to show that the public backs it. Really important then that we've got our campaign is here to mobilise that public support and demonstrate that there is support for what SPT has decided to do. Um, I started street campaigning, we organised public meetings, um, and some of the folk who helped to organise those for us are here tonight uh, in Cumbernauld and Kilwinning. Um, this is the Cumbernauld meeting. Um, Kilwinning meeting was really well attended. And um, the decisions um, that were announced on the 28th of June, the consultation results were really overwhelming, um, overwhelmingly in favour of public control of the bus network and public ownership of buses. Um, over 3,000 people took part. It was by far the greatest response SPT have ever had to public consultation and that's down to the hard work folk here did to maximise it. But you'll see the results have actually given SPT a bit of a problem, really, um, because the, the greatest support was for a municipal bus company, and 86% um, in favour, over three quarters in favour of re-regulating the buses, and the greatest um, level of opposition was to uh, a, a, a statutory partnership with the bus companies, so a, a bus service improvement partnership, which we've been campaigning against. So an overwhelming um, opposition to that proposal, 51% against Abisa. Um, so a real, a real level of um, huge support for our campaign objectives. Um, and Ellie and I um, were at the SPT meeting in June where they discussed the results and they are really decisive so the public has spoken um, the question is whether SPT will now act and how it will respond to these results um, will a BSIP be taken off the table um, will a municipal bus company now be prioritised within the regional bus strategy because currently it plays a very, or seen it as really a very small scale thing, a, um, a provider of last resort where there's not enough competition. Um, the backing here shows that the public actually want this to play a major role in, in the future. So how are they going to respond to that? Um, and um, will the regional bus strategy now reflect what the public have said that they want and their priorities? So these are all the things that are now at stake as we think about how to move forward. But the results give us a really strong foundation for the next phase of the campaign, and it's what we need to now build on. And I'll hand over to Elle to talk about that. Fantastic, thank you, Susan. Um, excellent. Um, I'm really amazed by this turnout, so thank you so much for coming out in the rain. Um, and. Yeah, so what I wanted to do to, to start off the presentation was, Susan mentioned the B network in, in Greater Manchester, but I just wanted to flag it up again. Greater Manchester is the first UK city region to progress with bringing its bus network back into public control since deregulation in, in 1986. So just wanted to focus a bit on what's at stake here, what is the prize that we're aiming for with this campaign, and it is a fully integrated, affordable, accessible public transport system. So you have all parts of the public transport network um, planned and controlled by a public body, in our case that would be SPT, is our regional transport th authority, planned in the public interest to meet communities' needs. 
And the only way to deliver that, as Greater Manchester has shown, and as all the English city regions that are now progressing with that, is to re-regulate the buses, to bring them back into public control. And we do that using this power called franchising, which is in the Transport Act 2019 in Scotland. Um, I also wanted to say a massive thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight, but for all the support that you've given to the campaigns so far. Get Glasgow Moving itself was set up nearly eight years ago to campaign for an integrated public transport system, but Better Buses for Strathclyde only launched last September 2023, specifically to lobby SPT around the, um, its regional bus strategy. Our petition has now gone over 11,000 signatures. I took this uh, screenshot earlier today, and I'm, I'm sure most people in this room have signed that. Um, and to all of these organisations, and I know there'll be representatives from these organisations in the room who have backed the campaign, and you can still back the campaign if you represent a community group, an organisation, or a community council. We're, we're, we're collecting more and more community councils that are supporting the campaign as well. You can also get behind. And, and again, thank you for coming out in the rain to SPT's offices. Um, I think we've done at least five rallies in the last year outside their offices. And unfortunately, there's going to be more. <laughs> All of that was to brace you for the bad news, um, which is that we have probably got at least another two years fighting before this decision is confirmed and then the plans can start to be rolled out. So we do need everybody, it's going to be an incredibly tedious process uh, and it's going to take a long time but we do need everybody to, to, to keep behind the campaign and to be ready to turn out when we need you um, because the only people that don't want this to go ahead is the private bus company bosses and you may have seen in the news um, the East Old Brothers who own McGill's buses are running a massive propaganda campaign to try to stop this happening. So it's us, the people of Strathclyde, against them, basically. So that's why it's important that, that we keep up the pressure. And we need to keep up the pressure across three different fronts. We're talking about the regional level with SPT, the Scottish government level, and then the UK government level, which um, Susan touched on. Um, and I know we do have some councillors in the room, Councillor Alison and, and Dowling from um, Renfrewshire. We have MSPs in the room, we've got Graham Simpson and Patrick Harvey and Paul Sweeney as well. So thank you so much for coming. We also invited all of the, all of the new MPs for Strathclyde as well. I don't know whether any are here. If not, we will be continuing to bang on their doors. Um, so um, uh, just just to mention that we also invited all the SBT board, but they have been given instructions by their chief executive not to attend because they are incredibly terrified of legal challenges from the bus companies. So they're under strict instructions not to be seen, to be publicly supporting the campaign. So I'm just going to outline um, what we, what, um, what lobbying we are proposing to do with SPT and with Transport Scotland um, over the next phase of the campaign. Oh, before that, don't worry if you can't read this. You're probably asking, why does it take so long? Well, the reason is because of the legislation created by the Scottish Parliament, which is incredibly complicated. And this is a flowchart which sets out the how, you, how SBT go about using the franchising powers. I know you won't be able to read that. If you're really keen, I've got printed copies at the front and you can grab that. Um, there is a public consultation, a statutory public consultation as part of that process. And unfortunately, that's not the one we've just had. It's another one that we're going to have to mobilise for. Um, but it's important to be aware of what is coming down the track. Um, so, as Susan already said, what we need SPT to do 
We are waiting in the next week or so, they're going to publish the full report from the consultation. We had the headline results in June, but the full report is going to come out early September and it is going to say what SPT are going to do in response to the results. So we're kind of on tenterhooks hooks to see if they are actually going to do anything in response to those um, results, which we think give them a very, very clear mandate to scrap the plan to do a BSIP, which is just going to sap resources, the bus service improvement partnership is going to waste time, um, which would be much better invested in doing the franchising, um, the work to do franchising. So they should move forward with that and they need to be much more ambitious with setting up a new publicly owned operator for Strathclyde. And we don't want any more unnecessary consultations. We know we're going to have to face this statutory public consultation, but SPT is saying they want to do an additional consultation before they even get start on the franchising process. So we're, we're absolutely horrified about that. But we are going to be doing a big demo outside SPT's offices again on Friday the 20th of September. So please take a note of that date and um, come down if, if you can. Um, and the message for that we will be um, crafting in response when we see the papers of what they're planning to do. Um, then with Transport Scotland, um, as Susan said, we need all of the different um, arms of government to be collaborating to make this happen. We need them to accelerate the enactment of the franchising powers. Those powers are in the Transport Act 2019, which we're coming up to five years since that was passed, and Transport Scotland still haven't part, um, fully enacted the powers, and they're saying that, that, that they've got um, guidance and regulations that need to be published before SPT can actually progress with that, so they are holding this up. So they need to get on with that, and then we want them to simplify the powers, which is what the Better Buses Bill in England is going to do. And our legislation is already the most complicated, as, as you can see, if you want to study one of those uh, flowcharts, because we, we have to have our proposals approved by an independent panel convened by the Traffic Commissioner, which doesn't happen in England. And that adds an element of risk, because we don't know who's going to be on this panel. Um, and we just want that scrapped. We want... SPT to do the audit, then to do the public consultation, <coughs> to review the results of that, and then for SPT to have the final to say that it's dem it, they, they, there are um, democratically elected politicians on the SPT board, they should be able to make that final decision for our region. And then they need to fund it. Um, now, our report, which some of you will have seen that we did with Centre for Cities last year, estimates, based on the Greater Manchester example, that to roll out franchising would take 50, 100 million pounds over the first five years. Um, and really that's a drop in the ocean if you look at that 1.2 um, billion pound city deal money, which obviously some of it's been spent already, but the, the transformational change it is going to produce, it's, it's definitely worth the investment. And the, one of the main focuses of our report is that the Glasgow city regions economy is underperforming massively as a result of poor public transport. So it's going to pay for itself if we sort the buses out. So to lobby um, Transport Scotland and also to shame them for, you know, it having taken five years for them to enact these powers, we've launched a new petition on the Scottish Parliament's website. So. Um, this is very technical, but it basically goes through those three steps that I um, outlined to accelerate the implementation of the bus franchising powers. And this is a really good thing for us to do, I think. Well, it was actually Paul Sweeney that suggested that we do this um, because we get into the Scottish Parliament system. Scottish Government has to do an official response to this within a month and then there will be a parliamentary briefing issued on it, and then it will get heard numerous times by the petition committee. Different people will be invited to give evidence, and hopefully something will happen as a result of this. So this petition launched mid-August. We've only got 663 signatures on this so far. Uh, I mean, it's only been live for, for about 10 days. 
but that is a priority now to try and build that up as big as the other petition. We're keeping the other petition open and we're still collecting signatures on the other petition because that will be useful when we go to the Parliament when we can say we've got 11,000 people supporting this. We want that to continue to grow but we need people signing this as well. Um, yes, I'm, there's a lot of detail on this because I didn't have time to do a sim simplified version. So this was the campaign timeline. The good news is we've done all of that. <laughs> so I'm going to go on to phase two. This is just, I've already said it's going to take two years, but this is just my estimate of uh, basically looking at what time, um, the timeline for SPT's um, bus strategy, and then looking at that flow chart. I'm not going to talk about this too much, but again, I've got printed copies at the front if anybody wants to grab one. So key actions, which we'll come back to at the end of the meeting, but please put Friday the 20th of September in your diary. We're going to be back outside SBT's offices again, probably saying, listen to us, what's the point in doing a bloody public consultation if you do not act on the results, and then saying you're going to do two more. <laughs> um, <laughs> sign, sign both the petitions. We need... Um, you probably all signed the first one, but please sign the new one on the Scottish Parliament petition. You'll find the link, um, it's now been added there. Um, you'll find both petitions if you go to that. Share the petition. As I said, you can affiliate if you're a part of a community council or group. You can organise a public meeting, um, especially if you're outside of Glasgow, if you're from other parts of the region. We're really keen. We're hopefully going to go to Clyde Bank in October um, and do a public meeting, but. We're really keen to reach all of the 12 local authorities across Strathclyde and be ready to mobilise to come to the Scottish Parliament. I'm hoping we can hire a bus and take people through from Glasgow. So Campaign bus. A campaign bus, exactly. So that will be fun. But that's definitely something to... Uh, they may only give us two weeks' notice, they say, so we'll have to be ready. Um, but yeah, that's all from me. I'll recap on the actions at the end, but I'm going to hand over to Tam. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for asking me to speak today. So, as I said, my name is Tam, and I'm one of the two uh, Just Transition officers at the STC, mostly responsible for transport. Um, I'm going to sit down to read my notes because I can't keep them standing up. Uh, I, re I recognise that there are many uh, experts in the room with a deeper insight some t uh, into this issue than I, but I, I also think it's worth recognising that it's a, a testament to the hard work and dedication of Get Glasgow Moving and Better Buses activists that we've reached this pivotal, pivotal point in the conversation about bus service provision. Um, I think these campaigns have kept everyone on their toes, including the trade union movement, and they're mobilising people and building momentum in a way that many other campaigns have struggled to achieve, and you can tell by the number of people that are in here uh, tonight. It's clearly an issue that's struck a chord, and it's why that the STC is happy to be a supporter of the campaign. So the STC has long uh, championed public ownership of our public transport system, driven by both ideological and practical reasons. Um, I would say it, defi it defies sorry. It defies common sense that private operators can treat such a vital piece of public infrastructure as a mere cash cow. The quality of public transport system is not just an operational matter, it's fundamental, fundamental to the well-being of our communities, the fairness of our economy and the sustainability of our future. Improving it is crucial to ensuring that everyone has access to reliable, affordable and equitable transport. The profits generated by private bus companies highlight a fundamental flaw in our transport system. When private companies run our buses, their primary objective is to maximise profit, often at the expense of service quality, fair wages and the community's needs. These pro profits are of often diverted to shareholders rather than being reinvested to improve routes, reduce fares or ensure better paying conditions for workers. This profit-driven profit model prioritises financial gain over the public good, leading to higher costs for passengers, reduced services, and a workforce that is undervalued and overworked. Public transport should be about connecting communities and not about enriching private investors. And I, I would say that these private providers are feeling the heat. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but I think that they're ramping up their publicity efforts recently. Mm -hmm. um, clearly worried about the growing momentum for public ownership. So just this week I saw an invitation to a, meet a meeting entitled Collab Collaborate to Accelerate to Net Zero with First Bus 
where, where attendees can enjoy a networking breakfast and hear presentations from the managing director of First Bus Scotland and their community commercial director. <laughs> um, not only that, but at this weekend's SNP conference, there's a fringe event featuring the transport uh, transport cabinet secretary Fiona Fiona Hislop and the same managing director of First Bus. And I would argue that the title of it is provocatively titled "Building Better Bus Networks for Scotland." And then, as Elliot uh, alluded to, with the McGill's publicity propaganda campaign recently, they've been ramping up their efforts, but one thing that they said was <coughs> that, um, that they thought the changing of the current bus model would be against natural justice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think all of this shows that they're scared, and you know, why wouldn't they be? I mean, a quick look into the accounts of First Group, the holding company of First Bus reveals that their CEO was paid around 1.5 million last year, well, the CFO took home 2.5 million. Meanwhile, dividends paid out doubled from 14 million to 29 million last year. So these numbers tell the real story. They're worried about protecting their profits, not the public interest. So public ownership of the transport system is also vital from a just transition perspective, as it ensures that the shift towards a greener, more sustainable economy benefits everyone, not just the select few. So under public control, we can prioritise investments in an environmentally friendly infrastructure, such as electric buses and expanded transport networks, while safeguarding the livelihoods of the workers within the sector. It will support the efforts to get people out of their cars and onto public transport, making our communities greener and more connected. So I appreciate for me, I'm preaching uh, to the converted here, and maybe some people just fundamentally disagree. Um, but the real reason I was asked to speak today uh, is because the STC has recently commissioned research uh, into bus service provision. Um, when I was originally asked to speak, I hadn't appreciated that the person that we'd commissioned to do the research, Jeff Turner, would actually be here. <laughs> um, so, um, but um, when we sent out the tender for, for, um, for the research, we essentially had five, five points that we were looking to explore. Um, analysis of the public subsidy of bus um, provision in Scotland, analysis of the private companies benefiting from the funding model and the profits that they are making, analysis of the treatment and satisfaction of workers and passengers um, from private companies, um, and a comparative analysis of publicly and privately owned bus uh, services in Scotland, um, demonstrating you know, what's happening within the current model. And then uh, the final point is to ideally uh, outline an alternative funding model and the uh, regulatory mechanisms that are required to enable municipal bus ownership across Scotland. Um, I'm not sure, Jeff, if you're wanting to come in with anything else now, or will we maybe? Uh, um, I'm coming after you. If that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's your okay, That's fine. Yeah. So I mean the. Je I mean Jeff met in person for the first time today, so you know the the. Um, research is still in its infancy and we don't have a lot to give you right now, but we're hoping that this research, the information that we're receiving, will be complementary to the campaign when it's released later this year. Um, it's worth knowing that we're not just looking at the Strathclyde region, but we're looking like right across Scotland. But the research that comes will, will and our engagement with this campaign, forms a part of the, the wider campaign for public transport in Scotland that the STC is engaged in. Um, <coughs> this week, potentially next week, we'll be launching a new peak fares campaign. Um, against the reintroduction of peak fares in Scotland. Um, there will be a petition and there will be actions probably around the first week in October. Um, I'm arguing that the campaign should be called Past Its Peak, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, as I say, the STC's engagement on buses is part of a broader mission to ensure that public services in Scotland are equitable, accessible and operate in the public's interest. And the focus of public ownership, workers' right, and accessible service underscores the commitment to a transportation system that serves the needs of everyone in Scotland rather than just the interests of private profit. So, I mean, I'll maybe give Jeff an opportunity there to, to maybe come in on, on some aspects of the, of the research. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Um, and uh, good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here again. I was last year for a Glasgow meeting back in 2021 for the COP. Uh, 26, and uh, I've done some work with Get Glasgow moving there. And really, a real pleasure to see just, uh, um, the better buses for Strathclyde uh, moving forward because I'm a member of the better buses for West Yorkshire, and uh, even that time, I, um, I share my fraternal greetings with you. That's out of the border. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things, if I may take this time, just to follow on what Sam uh, said. So, I'm very much at the, at the beginning of the, of the work, and my day job is a Transport consultant, so I'm both campaigning and consultant in this regard. 
Uh, um, but uh, what's what's clear, uh, you know, financially, what's clear is that whilst uh, sort of post-pandemic, uh, the the bus system across Scotland is still being heavily supported by uh, government subsidy, by either the concessionary fares or the you know, the sub subsidy to operating costs. The the amount of money that the bus, the commercial bus operators get from passengers from you and I is is now only about a third slightly over the third of the overall sort of cost of running the system. But in, in the middle of all that, again, post-pandemic, and still with not numbers of passengers up to anywhere where the pandemic was, so it went up to where it was before the pandemic, uh, the, the profits of the commercial operators seem to be coming back quite noticeably. Mm -hmm. Tam's already mentioned a quite sizable chunk paid out in, in dividend, mm -hmm. uh, 25 million uh, uh, in dividend alone, no, 29 profit to their parent company in the middle of what was still a recovery from the pandemic. 25 million, if you remember, is a quarter of the 100 million over the five years that they're estimated to, to run the franchise system. So, you know, maybe they're taking the money out before we, it disappears. <laughs> uh, um, um, but the, one of the ways that this profit is coming back, it would appear, certainly in Strat 5, uh, is uh, cutting routes, cutting late services, uh, cutting the frequencies. And things like that, and, and Strathclyde across Scotland is is the, the highest number of lost bus miles anywhere in the in, in this last well in the last five years, but particularly in this last year. So uh, you know, um, that's that's sort of just some of the things that I was was wanting to share, and 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 what the research is really, as Sam said, says, really to, to fill evidence for campaigns, campaigns like this as to uh, um, you know, the, the, the pitfalls of a continuation of this uh, uh, commercial deregulated system, but also not only uh, uh, that, but also the strengths of, of what we already have and what we see in other places of publicly owned, publicly controlled uh, bus systems. And if I may take this time, I just wanted to share a couple of things from, as I say, from South and Border and from the experience of of West Yorkshire, uh, out which we have had our franchising process approved by the combined authority uh, in, uh, in, in uh, yeah, March, April of, of this year. Uh, um, again, it's, it's still, as is mentioned, it's still a long process. It has been a long process for campaigners there, and, and it's still, uh, you know, there is still you know, a couple of years at least yet to go. Uh, but it's becoming quicker and it's becoming faster. If you talk to our colleagues in Greater Manchester who've been going for ages and they're even their, their, their assessment process was, was much longer. So the more local authorities uh, in England and Scotland do this process, it becomes quicker and quicker. Uh, and, and that's worth bearing in mind. If you're being told, as SPT are being told, that this is a very long-term thing uh, and uh, you know, so they have to have something else in place, the, these things can be moved a lot quicker than they used to be through the experience of, of doing them. The, and, and as a result of that, what happened in West Yorkshire, as I suspect was being talked about here in stuff like, is that we had to go through this charade of, of what's called the BSIP, the Bus Service Improvement Plan, uh, which was designed to fail from the very outset because you have to be able to prove it didn't work somehow to be able to move on to franchising, which is where they wanted. To, to get, and so it, it was put in place. It was put in place purely on the basis that it will take so long to get to franchising. We have to have something in place, uh, which has subsequently been proved not to be the case. Um, and it then, and the officers and politicians then spent several years, a long time, uh, constructing being able to prove that it didn't work uh, at, at the end, so that you can then justify uh, franchising. The the uh, and the last point, if I may. And apologies for, for uh, uh, taking your time with this, but uh, and, and this is partly one element of the of the STUC work, uh, as well as our, our experience in in, uh, in England, uh, is that this discussion around municipal bus uh, companies and franchising are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, in fact, they are you know integral in many in many regards. What's happening in West Yorkshire and what happens in uh, uh, Greater Manchester and, and uh, Ali may have touched on that, uh, is actually the uh, large elements of the network are coming under 
public console already. So Greater Manchester and West Yorkshire uh, and Liverpool and Sheffield are all talking about owning the depots and owning the buses. So what's increasing that that's under public control? So the, the next step we can intuitively think then is can you then as a public body, body own the staff? And so what you have, all the commercial sector is then bringing in their, in, in their argument, not my, in their words, not mine, is then the management expertise of, of, of you know, building this efficiently and commercially. But so the, the, the grey area, that then becomes a grey area if so many of these elements of what constitutes a bus network is increasingly under public control, how far are we away from the municipal control under a franchise? So that's already happening in England, which we don't have the conversation, unfortunately, uh, yet of actual municipal bus ownership. So apologies for that. Thank you, Jay. Um, very much applause for the panel. Yeah. Yeah. Tab and Jeff, what we're going to do is just have a very quick comfort break as discussed. We're going to come back just after 20 past. Remember the post it notes in the hat are there if you want to write something down to ask a question, but again, we are going to be doing classic hands up. Thank you. See you at 20 past.